Welcome back. I'm Barry Craig. Our college was formed by the merger of two fine old schools, the West Kentucky Technical College and Paducah Community College. West Kentucky Technical College started in 1909. Paducah Community College began in 1932, so we're celebrating a 75th anniversary this year. With me to talk about that is Paducah author and historian John Robertson and former professor here at the school. Welcome back, John. Well, thank you. Good to be here. 1932, that is the depths of the Great Depression, and the good citizens of Paducah decide to form a college, a junior college. That's remarkable in itself. But actually, they had a, an economic justification for it because you said, well, if one could go to a quality school at home, you'd have the equivalent of a, a scholarship that would equal to your room and board and other things. And so um, uh, they met uh, uh, actually over coffee at uh, Boswell's restaurant and were chatting about what could they do to help because, you know, 32, they're one fourth of all the workforce is unemployed. Right. And so, you know, the depth of the depression, uh, what had to be done was um, something for these students so they could continue their education. And so uh, they were discussing this at Boswell's and uh, uh, B.G. Kruger, who was the head of the uh, uh, shoe factory here, uh, invited everybody out to his house and said, well, let's, let's get together and discuss this. And one of the movers in this was uh, Tom Waller, who was an attorney here. And later he became the longest serving trustee of Paducah Junior College. So they met uh, <clears throat> uh, and formed in 1932 in December, uh, in a, what was to be a, an elite private two-year school. And actually, the first tuition was higher than that at the University of Kentucky. Hmm. But still, um, they met in the old uh, YMCA building. I think we have a shot of that. Uh, it had been a private home at one time. And that's uh, the address of that. Well, it's 707 uh, Broadway. Uh, in downtown Paducah, and as you see, uh, it was uh, uh, actually about a three-story house. Now, what would be standing there now? For that Nothing. House? It's uh, a part of the, uh, uh, well, it's part of Broadway Methodist Church. Right. Uh, they uh, incorporated that whole section there to the end of the block after we moved out on the present campus. Mm -hmm. So um, there had been a study, though, by the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company, and it showed that uh, in cities of over 30,000, uh, there was a void on education for uh, people going into colleges. And Schultz Riggs, the dec uh, he was a representative for Metropolitan Life, uh, suggested that, uh, well, perhaps we could put together a college here in Paducah. And that's precisely what they did. Uh, remarkable, if you think about where would you get a faculty? Mm -hmm. Well, you could find them any place. They were all out of work. And so they went to the bread lines in Chicago and other places and managed to acquire a fine faculty. Uh, well, they couldn't promise them much, but maybe they at least have uh, a place to mm -hmm. stay at and uh, something. But strangely enough, once the college started, I've always found this ironic, Despite the hard times, incredible. Uh, at one time, the college almost had to close because the grate broke in the furnace. And Governor Rosenthal, uh, uh, one of the uh, first trustees, paid for that out of his own Thanks pocket. Rosenthal Hall uh -huh. on campus is named for him. Named for him. So they were just, just on the edge of breaking Hand out. Hand to mouth. But they paid their faculty every time, on time. The first time they didn't, was the first payroll under the University of Kentucky. <laughs> Do you have any idea what the salaries were originally? Uh, no, but they were as little as they could get by I'm with, sure. obviously. I'm sure. But uh, I don't have anything. Uh, the early faculty, about how many members <clears throat> are we talking about? Uh, I think you originally had about six full-time, including U.R. Bell, who was a, a minister, but he actually served as a president of the first class. So, you know, they, they recruited and... Uh, uh, 
Well, were the first students mainly from Paducah? They were, as a rule, they were from Paducah. And most of them also worked. And so, you know, they had to make accommodation for that. And they became one of the hallmarks of the school. They would uh, uh, accommodate the students they had. Well, now, uh, something had to be done. And, well, now, can you imagine having to go to the people of Paducah and ask them to tax themselves? In a depression. In the middle of a depression. But that, by 1934, it became obvious that something had to be done. And so, uh, uh, well, it took a change in state law, and Henry Ward of Paducah got one through in 1934. So they were ready. Um, Public Law 165.170 allowed cities of a second class to uh, uh, form uh, boards uh, to tax for the benefit of higher education. So now the school managed just to barely struggle along and uh, still weren't getting tax support. So by 1936, Bell had left by then and the school was, um, well, in need of new leadership and new solid funding. <clears throat> so they turned to a, a young man who agreed to come up here and look at it after talking with his professors down at uh, Peabody College in Nashville. He was working down there on his advanced work in higher education, particularly specializing in two-year schools. So his name is Robert Gordon Matheson. And um, for some reason, people around here always thought his first name was Dean <laughs> because when he came to Paducah, uh, after Bell resigned, uh, they decided they wouldn't have a president. And uh, Governor Rosenthal, uh, the chairman of the board of trustees, acted as the chief administrative officer. And so what they needed was a dean. And so Matheson uh, took the uh, office of dean with the proviso that he uh, get a local tax bill through and he agreed to come here and try it for one year and see what he could do. So, um, And he stayed a lot longer than that. Oh yes, he stayed um, well until he retired at, uh, in 1967. So he became a symbol of the institution and everybody thought, you know, the, the chief officer was the dean and that was his name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what they did was rather interesting. Uh, he uh, organized a campaign, and the students played a big role in this. Now, think about it. They weren't going to benefit from it. It would all take place after they left, mm -hmm. but they went out and they canvassed the whole city. And they very carefully uh, worded the measure as it was on the... Uh, the ballot to say that if it was, you voted no, it was a yes. <laughs> and then they explained that to the people in the West End. And in the South Side, they didn't mention that fact. So, uh, you know, they uh, went out and actually pulled a pretty slick uh, deal. And the people of Paducah voted to tax themselves in the midst of this Great Depression. Well, uh, I thought that was a creative use of it. Uh, originally, the tuition had been $37.50 per semester, and you had a... The whole uh, thing? Yeah, and $5 <laughs> for a one-time registration fee. <laughs> and the we budget... We shouldn't tell the students that right now. Maybe, maybe students won't be watching. I'd hate <laughs> to get out, you know. Wow. Well, the whole budget of the school was $11,000. Wow. So that gives you some hint. And uh, at the time he came here, uh, they owed each faculty member $1,800. So they were in arrears on that. So Matheson comes in at a time of a real crisis and takes over. And <clears throat> uh, so what they had to do was to, to then push for continual programs to attract the people who needed it and to recruit additional students by providing programs that had not been previously available. So from the very beginning, it was a, a, a creative approach to scheduling and to uh, uh, 
uh, the classes that were offered in times. Well, uh, enrollment went up to 74, <laughs> and forcing the school uh, uh, later to think about moving somewhere. And so at the end of World War II, uh, they considered whether or not to build a new campus out near where President Tillman is, or, uh, or what just exactly should they do? They looked at some old buildings. Uh, one of the industries was leaving here. And in fact, they gave uh, the college uh, their facility for a dollar, I think it was. Uh, but it wasn't suitable for a college location. So uh, what they finally decided to do was to expand the old facilities downtown. And uh, uh, of course, those facilities had been damaged by the flood. Oh, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the f Location 707 is actually on a little levee there, and it's a little higher than other parts of the downtown area. So most of the damage to the building from the flood came not from the flood, but from the people who broke into the building and stayed there for a while. When they started evacuating, a lot of people moved there and moved into the second floor and mm -hmm. just took up residence. Mm -hmm. And finally, they were forced to move out but when they left, the water had been cut off. When the water got, uh, the water purifying system downtown was flooded. Mm -hmm. They cut off all the water and all the pressure was off, the uh, uh, hoses and tanks and everything. And so uh, these people uh, camping out upstairs, you know, they got to tinkering around and here's a faucet, they would turn it on, nothing happened. They left a lot of them alone. Oh my And so goodness. D. Matheson, all during the flood, we hid out, actually, and would go back into the building and try to preserve the boiler. And finally, the water got to it, and so uh, he had to evacuate. But they left the building, and all these taps were on. And when they first came back, they couldn't get in. And so for a while, the, all those water taps were on, and it flooded and damaged the building. So ironically, wow. the flood damage was not from the flood itself, but from the, <laughs> from the negligence Aftermath. of the occupation. Yeah. Right. yeah, but something had to be done. Um, but that brings up something else about Dean. Water reminded me. They had a, a swimming pool downtown. It was from the old YMCA. It's actually uh, Olympic size and indoors. And the college um, um, had, um, you know, um, physical education programs involving swimming and swimming meets and all that sort of thing. But times were so hard, how do you rechlorinate the pool? Well, Matheson, being a good Scotsman, learned that they would purify the water downtown about midnight. They would then pump it from there out to their holding tank out in the West End, about where Forest Hills is now. And so this heavily chlorinated water would leave downtown en route to the storage <laughs> tanks that the West did. He would come down at two o'clock in the morning and fill the pool and get extra chlorine in the water. I mean, it was wow. that tight. That's but amazing. That's amazing. And when we first, uh, when I, I was the 10th full-time faculty member down there. And when were you hired down there? Oh, in 63, I believe it was. So it was still Paducah Junior College. Yeah, it was still College Paducah then. Junior College, and right. we were still downtown. And uh, uh, we used to run off all our tests and everything on these uh, ditto masters. Right. They had a little proper backing on right. it. Right, right. Well, uh, we had specific instructions. You always typed everything double-spaced. All right. You ran off your test, then you threw away the cover and kept the master, put another sheet behind it, and typed in between where you had typed on the first one and get two uses out of a single master. <laughs> now, that wasn't uncommon. You just literally had to do something like that because right. it was so tight and so close. Right. But there was a camaraderie there that you don't find now. They wanted to do the best they could for their students, 
and they were interested in creativity and change, and it was fun. And now so many people seem to think it's an onerous chore, <laughs> which is a sad yeah. note on. Who were the other faculty that you remember going back that far? Well, uh, of course, they had uh, Tatter and uh, Pepper and uh, a lot of people who were well qualified in the original faculty. Um, but uh, uh, by the time I got there, it had changed, and most of the original group had gone. And so I came in with a group that included, uh, well, Royce Gregory was the vice president, and we had Glenn Morrell in history, and we had the, the Prices. Uh, 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 Dick Price taught language, and uh, his wife taught uh, English. And so, uh, you know, uh, then we had uh, the most feared teacher in Western Kentucky, Charles Smith, who taught chemistry. Now, why was he feared? Well, he was hard. <laughs> he was hard. He had uh, one arm that had been severely damaged in a motorcycle wreck, and it was just practically useless. But he'd take his students uh, on uh, field trips down to Murphy's Pond, and he would come back with these 10-foot rattlesnakes. And he would keep them in his office. And um, I know him because uh, my office is right next to the ladder that went down into a little dark basement where the men's restroom was. And I started down that uh, two steps into the lower level one day and I heard this slithering and then there was no light down there. Uh, the light was not functioning. Oh my goodness. So I had sense enough to stop and went back and got a flashlight and there at the bottom of the steps was a copperhead that had gotten loose. Well, uh, wow. But he insisted on quality. He insisted on uh, and later he went to Murray and became the advisor for the pre-med students. Gives you some idea of what we're mm -hmm. talking about here. Mm -hmm. But taking that one step further, uh, the basketball team was always looking for a easy four-hour course. Well, uh, there weren't very many of them. And they came down and they looked on the schedule that spring and there was a new course called Histology. And they all gathered around the office and said, hey, Dean said, what's this new course, histology? And Matheson, without even cracking a smile, looked right at him and said, well, that's history backwards. You start at the present, you go backwards. <laughs> and it's for our course. Oh, every, the whole team signed up for it. And the first meeting of the class, they walked in and there were microscopes on each and every desk. And there was Chuck Smith standing up there in his white lab coat with a malevolent grin on his face. <laughs> <laughs> well, they finally allowed them to reschedule, but I was uh, going to say hit the drop line. Oh, after that. oh yeah, 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 yeah. But it was kind of fun back then, and uh, yeah. Well, but they also were creative in how they uh, handled many things. Uh, for example. Um, Dean managed to get the school accredited by tagging on to the tail of the University of Kentucky. He offered the same curriculum as they offered up there, and uh, so we were sort of a, a satellite. Well, did, uh, was that sort of a forerunner to when the school became part of UK? Uh, not really, because there was a big gap in there where UK uh, wouldn't have anything to do with the school, and you know that was beneath their dignity. And uh, Matheson and others were really looking to Murray for help. And uh, uh, we established very close relations mm -hmm. with uh, Murray State and hoping that they would um, eventually uh, uh, include us into uh, a regional, we thought we should fit into a regional approach to education. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, but in the meanwhile, Paducah Junior College actually broke some national taboos. We had intercollegiate athletics with men and women competing on the same team. Rifle matches. I didn't know that. And they fired rifle matches uh, by telegraph. Now explain that. Well, uh, we would uh, compete with Martin, Tennessee, which was then a junior college. And uh, they would fire on their home range and report their scores back by telegraph. They <laughs> would fire in Paducah and report to them and it was a, a competitive match. And they had uh, one girl from Reedland 
who was a crack shot. And one, one of the boys became ill and couldn't compete on the day she filled in. And so we were having intercollegiate athletics uh, with men and women competing. Co-ed equally. and Co by Co telegraph. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, then other things, Matheson um, began to, uh, to sort of arrange courses to fill particular students. Uh, if you needed something uh, in uh, commerce, they began to add courses in that. Uh, in other words, they looked at community needs and fulfilled those, which is still one of the primary mm -hmm. goals of a true community yes, college. you're right. And so uh, uh, even when the flood, uh, he insisted that they complete the course and did that during the war too. Uh, if they couldn't give them a semester credit, he would give them a quarter credit. So he gave them credit for the hours they had completed before they were called up for service. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you had to sort of ride with the, with the tide uh, to meet the needs of the community because it was a community-based uh, approach to education. So, um, the, uh, the decision was made that finally, you know, we've got so many students, and after the war, this is what really triggered the, the big movement. The GI Bill, I guess. The GI Bill came mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. effect. And so, you know, uh, we had students coming in, and to meet that, they started a massive program in night classes. And for a long time, our night programs uh, were uh, greater than the day programs. Mm -hmm. They also realized we had a real shortage of uh, uh, adequate library support because we were using uh, a upstairs section in Carnegie to house the PJC collection. Hmm. And we didn't have our own library, but... Uh, well, that was, of course, down by the Grace Right Fiscal across Church. the street from the, uh, from the college. Right. So, uh, so there were a lot of things like that that had to be met. Well, so uh, with the assistance of the National Youth Administration, the college began one of the first work scholarship programs. And what they would do, uh, students would perform routine clerical and janitorial duties at the college, and oh boy, the wage was 25 cents an hour, mm -hmm. uh, up to $15 a month total. Mm -hmm. And Hall Howard Hill uh, was one of the first students at the college, and he was involved in that. He later became one of the, uh, uh, the first faculty um, and longest serving faculty under the PJC. Mm -hmm. uh, but so here you have them flexible enough to tap in on the new programs of the New Deal and still offering programs that fitted the needs of community. And sometimes if there was one job and a student couldn't work all the hours, Dean would split the job, put two students filling the same job. Mm -hmm. But he would also schedule their classes so that they could make up for the, the difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, so the Commerce Department, uh, and we'd had Commerce in Paducah for drawings, business school, since 1901. Right. And everybody was quite impressed by the quality they did. And in their, their Commerce work, they did at the time put out a good product. But uh, uh, by 1937, we decided that we better move in that area too. And so they began to move into and offer programs in uh, trade and commerce. Uh, well, now, during the war, he was also fortunate enough to get a, uh, a, a program here, uh, one of the V-12 programs, uh, where the Navy uh, paid people to come to school here. And he uh, um, was always looking for some way that he could find to meet community needs and also meet the needs of the students for a quality educational program. Well, at the end of the war, there was such an influx that we finally decided the only thing they could do was to give up downtown. The building was old, it was in need of repairs. They had made additions. In the 1950s, 54, 55, they had added classrooms. Uh, they'd added, uh, well, it was a uh, gymnasium upstairs and a big 70 plus seat auditorium dual purpose room uh, 
and we had filled that up. So they finally decided to bite the bullet and move westward. And uh, Luther Carson, uh, from the Coca-Cola family, uh, agreed, in essence, to give his home, oh, there was a $75,000 uh, price or something like that, but they had this molding plant, and so uh, they used the money they got from it to buy the property, and so we decided to make this major move to the West End. And that was in 1960, what? 61, I would believe. I'd have to check. Right. That was before my time. Uh, well, I came out here with them. 63. Come now we have it. two minutes left, so we got to. Yeah. I hate this. We got to okay. wrap this up. 63, so, 64. so, so we moved the part of the Great Westward Migration. Yeah. Okay, so we moved out in mass, and uh, the next thing we had to do under Matheson was to get Southern Association accreditation, and he did something unique. He flew the whole faculty down there, and we appeared uh, as the largest contingent at the meeting in Atlanta, and we made an impression. And they accredited us without any problem except in our uh, library holdings. So, you know, we were then able to say to, um, well, I was fortunate enough to be able to vote for the accreditation of Vanderbilt acting as the academic dean for Paducah Community College. That's great. So we were fully accredited and equal to any other school offering the first two years in the United so States. So in the few minutes we have left, then, then PJC becomes part of the University of Kentucky Community College system in 1967, I believe. Right. Uh, well, the president of the UK came down here to give our commencement speech and hinted that he wanted to. And uh, everybody said, well, if he, you know, he's going to do it. And he did. He got the community working on it, and they wanted to go with the UK. It was much more attractive to the community than association with Murray at the time. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Matheson was too old to continue because of their Adolf Rupp law. Right. The UK had wanted to get rid of Rupp as a coach, and so they said you couldn't teach after you were 65 or couldn't be an administrator after mm -hmm. you were 70. Mm -hmm. So Dean became the advisor to UK and saw to it that all the other UK community colleges got their accreditation. Mm. So he continued to be a driving force in two-year uh, college education throughout the United mm -hmm. States. And, of course, the Carson home is the administration building. It's the administration building now. And all of this was Carson's land. No, only uh, about 70 acres, and they added a whole bunch later, uh, thanks to uh, uh, Jack Rodering in particular, who was on the board of trustees mm -hmm. and a, a realtor and who became aware of an opportunity and we would get it. Mm -hmm. So I, with that, they expanded all the way out to the present uh, limit. And we've expanded to the end of our program. Ah. Thank you very much for joining us. My guest today was John Roberts, and our topic was the history of Paducah Junior College, Paducah Community College, and now West Kentucky Community and Technical College. I'm Barry Craig. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thank mm -hmm. you.